Welcome. My name is Katie Zimmerman, and I am a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and advisor for AEI's Critical Threats Project. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event, co-hosted by the West Point's Combating Terrorism Center, CTC, and AEI's Critical Threats Project. We're launching a summer mini-series that's exploring the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and other Salafi Jihadi groups in Africa, and looking primarily at the debates that center around whether these organizations are threats or whether they're local conflicts. Um, the debate series will cover a scope uh, and broad range of how these groups operate, and we're hoping to draw perspectives from experts who study the groups. This is the launch event, and for those that are following it today, please realize that you can submit your questions via email to Jacqueline Dirks at AEI.org, and we have a Twitter hashtag for you to submit your live questions to. You also can subscribe by email uh, and by uh, link to future invites for this summer mini-series. I'd like to introduce the moderator for the series today. It's Emily Estelle. She's a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and she's also the research manager for the Critical Threats Projects. She focuses on Africa, and she has really led the development of the study of US national security interests in Africa for the Critical Threats Project. Um, she read a, or produced a massive report on Libya years ago and is now launching a new study uh, that is really fascinating, and I hope that you follow her work carefully. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm really excited about this series. Uh, we are trying a format that we hope will really bring forward some of the interesting analytical and policy debates uh, related to ISIS, Al Qaeda, and other Salafi Jihadi groups in Africa. Um, and so to that end, I'm really excited to have a fantastic panel with us today. I'll introduce them and then we'll start going one by one through the panelist positions. Um, the topic of discussion for today centers on the question of how important African extremist groups affiliations are, specifically focusing on the Islamic State. Uh, some observers argue that pledges to global jihadist groups like the Islamic State are superficial and, and more like branding exercises. Others suggest that groups undergo a, a more fundamental trans uh, transformation when they join the Islamic State. Um, though, of course, there's debate on kind of how deep that, that transformation is and, and what it actually means. So the question that uh, we've asked each panelist to address this morning is what changes when African jihadist groups join the Islamic State and how much does that matter? Um, so let me go through and, and introduce the panelists before we get into their arguments. Uh, first, we've got uh, Dr. Jason Warner, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Um, we've got Brenda Githingu, an independent counterterrorism analyst. Vincent Fouché, a research fellow at the National Center for Scientific Research. And Aaron Zellin, uh, the Richard Borough Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm really excited to have this group here. A lot of expertise uh, looking across uh, a whole bunch of different groups affiliated with the, affiliated with the Islamic State in Africa. Um, so we're going to start off with Jason Warner. Uh, so Jason, whenever you're ready. Very good. Uh, Emily, thank you so much. And uh, as the Combating Terrorism Center's representative, I just want to offer uh, my own set of welcome uh, to, to all of those of you who are joining. Incredibly excited about this series and hopefully some of you who are participating uh, as viewers now will, will be kind enough to join us uh, as, as commentators in the future as we uh, develop the series further over the course of the summer. So um, the, the format for uh, this uh, panel, as you all have, have heard, is that we've got four um, commentators who are each given seven minutes, and I'm quickly eating into my own seven minutes. We're all tasked with presenting a thesis to the question, what changes most when African militants join the Islamic State? Uh, and so to kick off this series and, and this particular panel, um, my answer is this. Um, I argue that what changes most when African insurgents become formal provinces of the Islamic State is a question of perception. Uh, and so on one hand, I'm going to argue that how African insurgent groups perceive and view themselves uh, themselves changes with African groups becoming what I call IS norm adopters. Um, on the other hand, I'm going to argue in this very limited time um, that how external observers perceive these 
African insurgents changes. Um, and, and, I, and I bring to the fore a, a term that I use in my own sort of um, discourses, uh, which I refer to as ISIS myopia. And this is the, uh, the, the tendency to look at an affiliation with the Islamic State as a primary or a guiding feature of what these groups are. And so this extremely brief talk, again, will focus on these changes of perception, both by groups themselves, as well as by external observers of the groups. Um, so let me start with a few caveats, because as anyone who follows these conversations knows, um, the, the question of the meanings of African groups links to the Islamic State Central as a contentious topic. Um, and so when, when we're talking about what changes, uh, when groups become formal Islamic State provinces, um, I want to be clear about a few things that I, I don't mean, uh, and that I think all of the presenters would agree with me that we don't mean. Um, first, I personally don't mean that groups must fundamentally change when they join uh, the Islamic State as official provinces. In, in my experience and in my research, they do, but, but this is not to say that they must fundamentally change when they join the Islamic State. I also don't mean that African groups change in the same ways when they become provinces of the Islamic State. Um, in the research that uh, my colleagues and I have conducted, they definitely don't change in the same way. So one of the things that we have noted and continue to note is that there's tremendous diversity in how Islamic State provinces in Africa emerge, how they evolve, and what their connections with the Islamic State Central look like. And the third thing that I don't mean um, in, discussing, in discussing changes is that the Islamic State Central necessarily demands that these groups change. And indeed, one of the points that I'm going to argue in just a moment um, is that changes to the extent that they occur are often organic and internal to groups themselves rather than directed from the top down. All right. So once they join the Islamic State, uh, I argue that African insurgent group self-perception is one of the things uh, that, in my mind, changes the most. Uh, and they become what I have referred to as Islamic State norm adopters. Uh, so by becoming an Islamic State province, I suggest um, changes how African insurgent groups view themselves, leading them to adopt new tactics, new patterns of violence, uh, new relations with civil society, uh, and more broadly, new ways of moving about in the world. Uh, so of note, I want to argue that these changes have most frequently not been compelled by top-down directives from the Islamic State Central, um, but rather these are changes that members within these provinces, to include leaders, uh, began undertaking on their own to more closely mimic the behaviors and approaches that the Islamic State Central uh, became so well excuse me, so well known for during its heyday uh, between 2014 and 2017. Um, and so to the extent that these changes that I argue are most prominent are in terms of behavior, I think it's also important to note another thing that doesn't change when African insurgent groups are elevated to official provinces of the Islamic State. And what doesn't change is that they, they typically do not experience a flood of material resources, so weapons, cash, and fighters. Now, we've seen, of course, some uh, Islamic State provinces when they've emerged, particularly very early in their emergence, uh, to include in, in Libya and Sinai, um, the Islamic State's West Africa province, they have received some of these resources. But in general, the elevation to an Islamic State province does not necessarily, and, and more often than not, does not include this flood of material resources. So instead, because these material benefits um, are not the most prominent thing that changes, what we look at instead, for, from my perspective, is how groups have elected to change their behavior. And so um, to the extent that changes occur, um, a, a, a lot has changed and does change in terms of behavior adopted by groups themselves when they become Islamic State provinces. So one of the things that I think is, is most evident is new patterns of violence emerge. Um, raids of cities, I think, be, being the most common, uh, and I don't have time to go into all of these, uh, attempts by various Islamic State provinces across the continent to raid and hold cities. I think the adoption of new tactics um, to include beheadings, which we're seeing uh, very frequently um, by the Islamic State Central Africa province, Mozambique, uh, or ASWJ, is common. Um, the adoption of, of more extreme tactics like suicide bombings. We saw ISCAP DRC or, or the ADF um, last week uh, with its first suicide bombing. Um, new relations with civil society also emerge. Um, new approaches to takfirism, uh, the exacerbation of sectarian tensions, the exacerbation of ethnic tensions, uh, and new attempts at governance. Another thing that changes is connections that Islamic state provinces have with one another. 
Um, by becoming Islamic State provinces, they're now embedded within this network that is not only hierarchical with the Islamic State central, but also lateral, uh, allowing connections between other Islamic State provinces in Africa. Other things that change are new relations with the state uh, and new counterterrorism pressure that comes about uh, to, to deal with these groups. I'll note as my time dwindles, and man, a seven minutes, a short amount of time, um, that in addition to African groups' behavior changing uh, and their perceptions of themselves changing, outsiders' perceptions uh, of the groups change as well. I don't have time to go too deeply in, into this, but I will suggest that uh, a, a process that, that I have seen uh, that I refer to as ISIS myopia occurs, where those who either seek to elevate the importance of the Islamic State connection are pitted against those who seek to minimize and, and indeed in some cases ignore uh, Islamic State connections. And, and of course, uh, I think that the most reasonable approach uh, to, to reconcile that is to recognize that we should neither overemphasize uh, nor underemphasize the meaning of the Islamic State affiliation as external observers when trying to understand these groups. Uh, with that, I will be respectful of the time. I look forward to a very vibrant conversation. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Jason. And I, I like the term ISIS myopia. I think that's gonna be definitely worth discussing further uh, that particular debate. Uh, first, I'd like to go over to Brenda for her presentation. All right, so um, I'd like to preface my presentation by stating that African Islamist groups are an outcome of various affiliations that they've held throughout their lifetime prior to the Islamic State. And therefore, changes that they have undergone are not necessarily new or as a result of their affiliations with the Islamic State. These affiliations are regional and international in nature, as many founding members of Islamist groups were educated abroad. And this is a major thing that uh, they have in common. These individuals returned to their communities with alternative interpretations of Islam, which, although was shunned by a majority of the community members and leaders, they still managed to garner an audience within the local context of state repression, of religion, uh, poverty, and poor governance. Furthermore, religious studies also became uh, came to be offered in countries like Sudan, Somalia, Kenya, and Tanzania, where radical teachings eventually turned into material that could be easily shared across borders. With the emergence of technology and the internet in the past 10 years, this has become much easier to do than before. It's also important to remember that these groups have existed so long that they've actually built the operational capacity to recruit, train, and radicalize, thus duplicating the affiliation model at a regional level. Al-Shabaab, which although is not an Islamic State affiliate, is Al-Qaeda's the deadliest affiliate with considerable operational sophistication and major networks that expanded throughout the region, including the DRC, which um, has been a key partner of the ADF with logistics and training from 2011 and even after the ADF's affiliation with the Islamic State. So the idea that um, African insurgent groups are purely local hold purely local identity or pursue purely local goals doesn't account for the interconnectedness uh, or interconnected context uh, in which they operate. So this is the regional and intercon intercontinental context for the emergence of Islamist groups more receptive to um, affiliations offered, to, uh, offered by the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. So in doing so, these groups and extremist radical networks uh, also became proxies for introducing and supporting um, international affiliations, which reaffirms the regional nature of Islamist groups in Africa. So by 2015, uh, the Islamic State came to benefit acquire matured groups which had established their own networks and undergone their own strategic, ideological, and organizational changes, which includes uh, the fact that the AF adopted a more Islamic identity post-2012, uh, and uh, while Makulu was arrested in 2015, which obviously had nothing to do with the Islamic State, uh, uh, Baluku spearheaded the Islamic State movement. Um, extremist networks throughout East Africa with um, affiliated with Al-Shabaab also shifted from recruitment and radicalization for the group 
um, towards more active militancy, uh, particularly, particularly in uh, Tanzania, but um, actually failed. Um, but although I'm arguing this, um, there are still changes that happen post affiliation uh, with the Islamic State. So um, the AF moved from a relatively secretive uh, organization, which we didn't really know more, uh, much about, um, into disseminating propaganda under the Islamic State uh, logo. The group also split. Uh, factionism was also a major change that happens with affiliations. Um, and there's now a smaller faction that remained loyal to Makulu's vision of an Islamic insurgency in Uganda. Um, these groups also adopted um, Islamic State campaigns like prison breaks, which we saw uh, in October 2020 with ADF. Um, and also the Islamic State in Somalia also participated in, in uh, the, the Islamic State campaigns. From a strategic point of view, the Islamic State also offers these groups a more regional mandate, which is already in place due to the interconnectedness of these groups. However, uh, naming them as, for example, West African or Central African province uh, gives them a more regional a regional mandate. Um, for example, the Islamic State Central African province adopted uh, the Mozambique group. So, um, however, from a tactical perspective, uh, there's no de definitive uh, transfer of know-how from the Islamic State as uh, the, the modus operandi of these groups remain subject to local and regional factors. Uh, the operational capacity of Ansar Suna, for example, in Mozambique could largely be attributed to the fact that it holds foreign fighters from across the region, um, like Tanzania, Kenya, Somalia, and so on. So uh, changes po uh, post-Islamic State are ultimately permitted by the group, as affiliates are largely autonomous, working within their own context for the survival and benefit of their own members and their own group. And secondly, uh, affiliations uh, vary from group to group, depending on what type of relationship the leadership wants to maintain. So uh, the closest point of contact still remains regional affiliates who probably play a more uh, influential role in uh, changing uh, African Islamist groups than the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Thank you so much, Brenda. I, there's a really interesting point to keep discussing there about mandate, I think, and, and how this overlaps in an interesting way with, with Jason's points about self-perception and how groups see um, their mandate and if that changes before or after um, they gain that, that uh, Islamic State affiliation. Uh, I'd like to go to Vincent next um, to talk us through a particular case in, in West Africa. Vincent, I think you're muted. Yeah, I haven't learned during a whole year of confinement. Um, so I just want to, to start by making a, a brief comment on, on the sources we can use to discuss this affiliation, because I think it's a very important aspect of the discussion uh, we can have or we can't have. Um, and for a long time, uh, what we had uh, as sources to, to think about this question uh, was uh, some marginal associates, former captives or, or detainees, uh, and sort of low-level associates that, that ended up in jail rather than executed. Um, and of course, jail interviews are not great. Uh, we had propaganda. And of course, you could always dismiss propaganda as propaganda. And, and we had TTPs, um, tactics, training, and procedures. Um, but, but then it's a sort of, uh, you know, it only allows for, for hypothesis. And I think, at least for me, uh, doing research on ISWAP, a turning point has been access to uh, graduates from, from a variety of de-radicalization programs carried out in, in, in the Lake Chad Basin. And so then you talk to people who feel safe to talk, and some of whom have been associated fairly closely. Uh, to the to the fairly discrete connections between Islamic the Islamic State and its franchises, and so I think when you when you want to think about this question, you have to think about okay, so how can we pronounce ourselves one way or the other? You know, on, on what basis? Um, and, and my impression, based on those interviews, is that the you know the the affiliation to the IS has been uh, has been has been important. And, and in a way, has also been an echo of interna internal changes or, or, or a thirst for internal changes as well. So there's sort of a connection here of, of local and global dynamics. And I want to discuss this in three main steps. First of all, I want to discuss the, the forming of the link itself. Uh, then I want to discuss the changes. 
And then I want to sort of propose a, a broader characterization of the link, at least as far as, um, as, as the West Africa province, Lake Chad, so Boko Haram, if you want to call it that, um, is concerned. The first thing that was very striking during, during the interviews was that even in the age of electronics, the linking, uh, at least initially, was not easy at all. Um, we know that um, in, in terms of, of the, the, the linkage to, to Al-Qaeda um, uh, after 2009, um, took direct uh, contacts, you know, so people who had been trained before with Al-Qaeda basically went uh, to uh, to the Sahel, um, physically went to the Sahel to reconnect. Um, and it's been quite difficult for, 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 the, uh, for, for the Boko Haram um, um, people interested in connecting to the IS, actually. And it took a fairly random event, uh, the, the arrival of a group of, uh, of uh, Libyan um, IS-connected jihadi uh, to Lake Chad. Um, which wasn't expected, and, and they were not actually sent by the Islamic State, which, you know, I had made sort of a mistake there, uh, but I stand corrected now. And so they, they came and they were the ones who, who, who were able to, to engineer the link. And so uh, I think it's quite important to, uh, to, to, to think and keep in mind the, the, the sort of peculiar difficulties um, of the link. Uh, then um, my second point about the, the nature of the changes, and here I really agree with, uh, with Jason's characterization. Um, it's really about norms. Um, there was some money coming in, definitely, um, though actually uh, when you talk to the people who were involved, um, uh, there were, uh, you know, on a number of times, those transfers were blocked by, by at various level. Um, by various international um, or national authorities. Um, so some money came. But in a way, it hasn't been the most important. What, what has been really important is how new norms um, you know, were transferred and, and really changed behavior. And this, this, this included, of course, tactical advice, um, you know, how you organize attacks, how many fighters uh, you send, how many fighters you put in, in each SUV, um, you know, the, 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 you know, all sorts of, of, of tactical, tactical review. But I think what has been more important and, and more consequential in terms of the, 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 the fate of, of ISWAP and, um, and, and the fate of the faction that stayed with Shekau and did not follow ISWAP's advice um, has been organizational changes. Um, you know, the, 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 the uh, formation of uh, permanent units. Uh, you, 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 you leave the militia model that Shekau was working from and, and you decide, you ask people to choose whether they'll be permanent fighters or whether they'll be civilians, potentially with a gun to take part to defensive operations, but, uh, you know, not going on offensive operation. Uh, there was an attempt to implement a wage system. Uh, there is, of course, this question of uh, abstaining from attacks against Muslim civilians. Um, there's been a push for uh, economic sustainability, an insistence that you don't plunder civilians, you have to, to, to work them as a tax base, um, taking, you know, fairly um, small taxes, but, you know, sustain it over a long time. Um, um, a move also to, to com computerize the administration, you know, um, what they call idaria, uh, develop uh, administrative structure um, to sort of consolidate all that. And I, you know, the, those changes, when you talk to, to defectors, they really were important. They were perceived as such, and they have, they have uh, certainly affected the fate of the movement. That being said, I think it's important. Um, it's not always easy to, to identify the respective role and of the local drive and of the global drive for change. Um, we know, for instance, that Shekau had already been criticized about a number of issues. This led to the creation of Ansaru in 2012. So in a way, the, the debate and, and, and the, the aspiration for change was already there before the connection to the IS. And, and the impression is that basically local reformers in 2015, 2016, reached out to the IS, hoping that they could use the IS influence to, to, to curtail Shekau. Um, and I think that, that again, that, that local initiative must be, must be um, taken in. Uh, the, the other and related aspect is, of course, that the implementation of changes can vary um, over time. Uh, as we know, Shekau refused to implement a lot of changes uh, that the IS was suggesting. Um, and and his, even his successor, actually, even though they, they proclaimed a greater loyalty to the IS, well, you know, they were doing it a la carte. You know, they were picking, picking uh, what, what, they, what they would um, do or not. Uh, but I think the conclusion of that, uh, you know, it's the conclusion that came in May 2021. Uh, the one faction that aligned with the IS, the ISWAP, 
basically came on top and Shekau killed himself. Um, and I think it, it means that um, there's something about the, the um, strategic thinking uh, that comes and the new strategic norms that are associated with the association to the IS that, uh, that played a part in giving Iswap the upper end. So I think, you know, the, those, those, as, those have, been, have been influential um, changes. And then maybe my final point is, if, you, if, if I want to think of a, of a way to categorize the relationship between the IS and ISWAP, the one I use is franchise. I, I'm not the first one to have used franchise. I think there's an early paper by Jason uh, where he uses the notion of a franchise. And I think it's a really good fit because a franchise is a very strong brand. Uh, it comes with specification uh, you know, that you have to adhere to more or less. Uh, there is some remote support, some some oversight training, and and maybe sometimes occasional visits, but there's a lot of autonomy. There's a lot of uh, you know game uh, for the local players. Um, uh, maybe as a as a way of conf of, of conclusion, um, I, I think that you know the situation must be different for for each and di each um, different um, IS province. Uh, and I think maybe we can we can consider uh, that some franchises at some point, um, the IS may try to to develop them into branches. You know, may be interested in in tightening its hand a bit, in you know, may, taking some more control. It it might be a description of of, of what's happening now in Iswap in Abu uh, with Abu Musab. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I I don't think so, um, uh, given the evidence I have so far. But it's a possibility, and we have to think about it. And I think it's important to 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 develop a sort of uh, you know um, uh, an axis of uh, of, of, of IS uh, provinces uh, relationship. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Vincent. Uh, I really like the concept of franchise too, and I think it gets after some of the nuance that often gets lost in this debate where um, we recognize that these individual groups retain a lot of agency and that they each behave in different ways. And yet we do see um, some specific ties back to either different Islamic State linked groups or to Islamic State leadership and some, uh, if not uniform, some kind of concurrent changes in behavior across different groups. So, and that's, I think, where, where oftentimes we get stuck in this in this debate. Um, I'd like to go to Aaron to talk through another example, uh, possibly a unique example uh, focused on Libya. Thanks for having me. Uh, so as noted, I'm gonna be talking about ISIS in Libya. Obviously it's a shadow of its former self um, when uh, it was pretty strong back in 2015 and 16. Um, but I think what's unique about IS in Libya compared to all these other cases um, in many respects is that it was essentially an in-house creation from IS core in the same way we saw with Al-Qaeda and AQAP. Um, uh, many of the key players in the leadership and those that helped build IS in Libya had previously been fighting in Iraq and Syria, were part of uh, a battalion called Katibat al-Batar al-Libi within Syria, um, and, and many of the people uh, that were in charge of it had had come from Syria back to uh, Libya, mainly Libyans themselves, as well as a number of Tunisians. Similarly, while we talk about how there's a local group that eventually decides to pledge Baya to the leader of ISIS, um, of course there were cases where uh, the local a local group that had been there previously, Ansar al Sharia in uh, Libya. Um, uh, defected number of its members um, to IS. However, it's important to note that many of the leaders within ASL, as well as many of its uh, fighters, had either previously been recruited to fight in Iraq in sort of the 2003 to 2009 phase, um, or uh, were involved in training and facilitation related to recruitment to jihad in Syria, sort of around 2000, 11, 12, up through 15 or so. So in many ways, the IS in Libya is fully integrated within IS core uh, in a way that we don't see with any other groups. And that's why I think it's the most similar to what we've seen with ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Um, uh, and, and therefore, if you look at the way it controlled territory, it's very much identical in the governance style. It's very similar in the fact that they did 
have the capacity and ability to establish the double wean there, the administrations locally, and they were co-opting the local sort of industries and putting them under these administrations within the governance model. Um, similarly, uh, and the media front, you saw it was very similar too in that uh, they're producing a lot of different provincial level videos uh, on a relatively quick scale. Of course, it wasn't the same rate as what we saw in Iraq and Syria, um, but it was far more than we've ever seen with any other um, IS branch outside of the core territories. And similarly, we saw some uh, uh, of the same styles, I guess you could say, or, or production values or cinematography um, for, for lack of better terminology. Um, for example, uh, you saw a number of videos where um, individuals from other countries that had come to Libya, they would talk about how it was important for people to go there um, to join up with the fight. And that's also one of the reasons why, similar to Iraq and Syria, we saw a large number of foreign fighters going to um, the territory in Libya for a certain amount of time. Based off of my own research, it's <clears throat> up to at least 2,500 uh, uh, foreign fighters. Of course, most of them were Tunisians, um, but we still saw many foreign fighters from areas that previously were only um, really involved in local or regional fights and not going all the way to a place in another region. Um, and that's where we saw people from West and East Africa going all the way up to North Africa to join up with IS's operations there. Um, in addition to this, on the media front, we, uh, you know, similar to the execution campaign that we saw with IS um, in uh, August, September 2014, um, with the assassination and beheading of a number of journalists and humanitarian workers, um, we saw this with the killing of Coptic and Ethiopian Christians on the beach in Libya. So sort of this uh, spectacle that they're trying to create in the same way we saw with um, Iraq and Syria to, is more of a media event in some ways than anything. Um, on a military level, there were some similarities. You saw more of a conventionalization in the way that they fought. However, unlike in Iraq and Syria, where there was a lot um, uh, greater hardware and, and bigger types of uh, weapons, sort of like APCs and uh, Humvees and the like, um, you didn't see that level just because of the situation in Libya was not ever as violent or as dire in the same way we saw with the fighting in Syria in particular, but also in Iraq to a lesser extent. Um, if you look at uh, the number of uh, deaths within the Libyan uh, context uh, over the last 10 years compared to Syria and to a lesser extent Iraq, it pales in comparison. So, so there wasn't also necessarily that same kind of need. One thing to note also in this relation was that uh, you saw the leadership of the group coming from the core itself. Uh, so the first leader, uh, Abu Nabil al-Anbari, uh, he previously was a wali or governor of Salahuddin province in Iraq. And then the second guy, Abdul Qadir al-Najdi, was originally from Takrit in Iraq, illustrating again that there were these greater connections and in, in many ways that there was the seamlessness between IS Corps and IS Libya. Um, similarly, much of the leadership structure, many of the key positions were run by Tunisians, Egyptians, um, as well as Sudanese. Uh, and therefore, uh, while you did have Libyans involved, it didn't necessarily have the same roots, I guess you could say, as we've seen develop in Iraq and Syria over the last 10 years in the context of Syria, or maybe 20 years in the context of Iraq. Um, of course, there were differences. Um, as I alluded to previously, um, uh, the Libyan civil war in many ways is different than Iraq and Syria. Um, it's far less violent, for one. Um, and then you also don't see the same type of sectarian dynamics that IS was able to use in the Iraq and Syrian context in relation to the Shia-led government in Baghdad or the Alawite-led uh, government in, uh, in uh, uh, Damascus. And therefore, um, while, of course, there were different ideological differences between many uh, factions within the Libyan civil war, um, especially in the areas that IS operated, which was mainly in the northern parts of it, they were all mainly Sunni Arabs. Um, uh, and, and, and also, unlike in Iraq, where they've already been operating by the time things started uh, kicking off again in 2012 and 13, they'd already been operating there for more than 10 years. And then in the Syrian context, um, while 
they obviously weren't fighting there previously until the Syrian civil war. They had these facilitation and recruitment networks um, as well as many safe houses within Syria going all the way back to 2002, 2003 to help out with what was going on inside of Iraq. And therefore there were some greater local roots than say in Libya where much of the Libyan jihadist movement prior to 2011 was operating either in Europe or they're operating in other foreign fighter zones, whether it was Libyans who went to Iraq to fight or Libyans who had previously been in Afghanistan. Um, and therefore, you didn't have the same kind of roots. And also there is greater um, sort of diversity and competition within sort of the Islamist sphere within Libya as well, um, which makes it a bit more difficult to recruit since you could potentially go with more Muslim Brotherhood like Islamists or these Mahali uh, Salafi types um, as well as others as well. So uh, there's just a different uh, competitive sphere in some ways um, that uh, that provides an avenue for other people to mobilize that uh, wasn't seen as quite of effective, I suppose, um, in the context of Syria. Um, so I'll leave it at there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so I, I have a bunch of questions for, for everybody and I'll use my prerogative to ask some of them, but I also wanna remind the audience uh, to please submit some questions. We've had some rolling in, so thank you for those who've sent questions already uh, and we'll get to them soon. But if you have a question uh, for the panel, you can either email it to Jacqueline, whose email's up on the screen or tweet at us using, using the hashtag. Um, to start off, I think I, I want to pick on, on Jason first. Um, you had argued that groups change their self-perception when they become Islamic State provinces. Is that self-perception shift a permanent one? And you mentioned um, kind of the heyday of, of the Islamic State starting around 2014. You know, now that the Islamic State is kind of not in that same heyday, um, what changes might we, might we see in, in these groups' self-perception, or kind of how much do African groups' identities depend on the trajectory of the Islamic State globally? Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly. Um, so, so I, I guess to the the first part of that question as to whether or not this is a permanent change, I, I guess I would just say, um, to the extent that changes have occurred, um, th there's no sort of likelihood of a reversion to a a, a sort of um, pre-Islamic State existence, right? In other words, everything is is sort of m moving. It, it, there's a constant dynamism, I guess I would say. So, so to the extent of, of whether or not it's a permanent change in identity, I would say it likely is. Um, I think you're, you're, the second part of this is, is, is actually far more interesting. Uh, I would be interested to hear others' opinions, but um, interestingly, the, the sort of self-perception uh, of being part of this broader Islamic state network, uh, of, of this sort of broader goal, um, seems not to be tied, uh, in fact, to the Islamic State Central's global success or failure. Uh, and so, interestingly, of course, we've seen um, the Islamic States, uh, you know, of course, this is debatable if you call it ISCAP or if you refer to these groups as ADF or ASWJ, but um, these are the first two global provinces of the Islamic State that emerged following the fall of Baghouz, right, following the loss of the Islamic State's last um, territorial um, part of the caliphate. And so, in fact, in Africa, you're seeing groups pledge allegiance even when uh, the Islamic State Central is, is clearly uh, on the decline. Um, and in fact, uh, whether or not he was here, I, I would reference uh, uh, something that Aaron had written at one point, which is that um, these groups are likely to endure precisely because they can rely on what he described as, I believe, a, a nostalgia narrative, right? Which is that the Islamic State um, at its peak was so extensive, so important, so inspiring that even if at the at the contemporary moment it no longer exists, that idea of what it once was is still a motivating phenomenon for many of these groups. On the on the topic of kind of later stage uh, African provinces, the the one that comes to mind is Islamic State Central Africa Province with the branches in in DRC and in Mozambique. Uh, Brenda, I, I wanted to ask you, because you talked about uh, the Islamic State kind of acquiring groups that um, were already at later stages in their development, but um, the Mozambique group might actually be a, a counterexample to that. So ASWJ, Ahlusuna, ISIS Mozambique, whatever we want to call it, which is its own panel maybe, um, 
you know, the Islamic State pledge came fairly early in that group's development and its leadership and its aims are still pretty murky. So can you explain a little bit how you see the ASWJ Islamic State relationship in Mozambique and, and what it might mean? Sorry, um, Ansel Zuna is definitely not a new uh, group. It emerged at various stages in Mozambique. Um, so in 1998, 2006, 2010, uh, those were the years in which we saw radical sects emerging in different locations in uh, Cabo Delgado. And um, it wasn't very clear as to whether they were connected, but um, since they seemed to have risen under different leadership, um, and it's still not clear whether they're the same group that we're dealing with um, after 2017 when, they, when the group emerged. Um, so this group has been in existence for a very long time. And I think also an important thing to note, to note is uh, the group was also an outcome of the failed attempt towards active militancy in Tanzania um, in 2017, where there was a group um, on the border of uh, Kenya and Tanzania and Tanga, which um, actually attempted to pledge allegiance to the Islamic State, and this was not recognized. And the group split between the DRC and Mozambique, and, and this is how we start to see a connection between the Central African province and uh, the group in Mozambique. So it seems like it's, it's a long time coming, at least for the group that has now achieved this uh, status. And um, also an important thing is that uh, the foreign fighters and ideologues from Tanzania remained uh, very influential for the group, uh, including the fact that a Tanzanian has been identified by the State Department as a leader of the group. So it's definitely a very concerning development for um, the Southern African region, since uh, there isn't there hasn't been a presence of the Islamic State uh, before. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the idea of kind of at which stage in development a group kind of gains this affiliation is a really interesting one. Um, and I'd like to circle back to, to Vincent to talk about what can happen even after that link has been established in the case of Islamic State West Africa. Um, so Vincent, you had drawn out the concept of a franchise where Islamic State associates kind of negotiate within the brand, I guess, of, of Islamic State core, adhering to parts of it, but also maintaining uh, a fair bit of, of independence, um, which has also been kind of very divisive in the context of, of internal uh, Lake Chad dynamics. You raise the question of whether the Islamic State leadership will try and kind of move that group from franchise to branch or exert some kind of, of greater control. Um, can you play that forward for me a little bit? Do you think that will happen? and and if the Islamic State makes that attempt, what will will happen with um, yeah, the Islamic State West Africa, with, with Boko Haram, recognizing that a lot has changed very recently? I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on whether that trajectory is one that makes that group more dangerous, less dangerous, and you know, where do you see this going? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, of course. I, I mean, I, clearly the movement has become more dangerous, more efficient. Um, if you look at the kind of, uh, at the way in which, for instance, the curve um, has, has, has changed, there's been a, a drastic drop in the killing of civilians and a, a, a drastic uh, up in the killing of military in, in the region since 2018, basically. And I think that has a lot to do uh, with, with, with ISWAP. Um, I, I mean, I, I was picking noise that, um, I mean, ISWAP is in a strange position. In a way, it is. Uh, it has become a figurehead uh, for for the IS. You know, it's they 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 vaunt it all. You know, they 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 put it forward. It it comes to the cover of Al Naba on and on, and and it's it's you know it's always getting the employee of the week stars, uh, or not always, but very often. Um, and so, and it's one of the few places where they, they actually can claim um, that they have uh, a state-like dominance. You know, they, they do govern, um, I don't know, a few dozen thousand square kilometers, more or less. You know, they, they raise taxes, they, 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 they render justice. Um, they are a state there. Uh, they're not a state anymore uh, in Iraq or, or Syria. Um, and, and so, I guess perhaps it's tempting on their part to, to sort of... Uh, increase their input. Um, and I hear that it's partly what, what was going on earlier this year and, and the return of Abu Musab and maybe a, 
a sense of frustration um, about the way in which the IS, um, the ISWAP was, was going, you know, some renewed problems with civilians, for instance. I hear that there's a commission currently um, actually launched by Abu Musab uh, reviewing uh, wrongs uh, done uh, internally, but also done to civilians living in the Islamic, in the ISWAP area. And, and so, but then my sense is they, they realize that, that you know, they, there's a way they can't really go too far. I think I think they understand that uh, you, you can't just send a Syrian guy and and you know for him to be the wali of Iswap. That they understand that that, that you have to preserve this uh, this local impetus. Um, you know, I, I think those those it's been said by a number of people, but jihadi movements have a long history in failure and a long history in learning from failure, and 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 it has made their politics um, quite astute. Uh, in many ways, you know, if you, if you read the sort of doctrinal stuff, it's actually pretty clever. And I, I, I think um, the, you know, as far as, as ISWAP is concerned, um, my guess would be uh, that, that, you know, they, they, they understand that. But, but my sense is also that they've been thinking about trying to tightening their, their, their grip on the organization. So it's, it's on the table. Um, you know, I don't know which way they'll go. Thanks. Uh, to shift to the the case where Islamic State leadership had the the tightest grip, Aaron, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, given that Islamic State Libya was this quote in-house creation, but has also collapsed in a, a fairly dramatic way, what does that mean for the Islamic State brand in Libya? And you mentioned the kind of competition within the the Islamist sphere in the country. Kind of, do you think there's another iteration of the Islamic State that comes forward, or is it kind of too tainted at this point and um, won't won't kind of return in, in Libya in the way that we've kind of seen groups return in some other cases. Yeah, I think part of the problem with IS in Libya today is the fact that it was essentially an in-house creation of Libyans and Tunisians primarily who had been foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria, um, as well as some other foreigners that came out and didn't have the same kind of uh, deep historical roots within communities in different areas within Libya um, in the same way that we've seen maybe in some of these other contexts where these groups have been around for a number of years before they even decided to say that um, they pledged Baya to uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the new leader. Um, so I think in some ways while when they're at their peak in that 2014, 15, 16 time period, because there was such a close connection and they're able to follow essentially the same modus operandi as IS in Iraq and Syria. Once they were rolled up and most of their leaders were killed, um, it didn't have that same ability to sustain itself. And that's why we've seen them having a difficulty in being able to come back. So if, if you look at what happened in Iraq, you know, sort of uh, many view the, the downfall of their initial version around 2009, even though they're only tactically defeated, um, but they're able to come back by 2012, 13, of course, the Syrian civil war helped a bunch with that as well. Um, but now we're already more than four and a half years out from the loss of territory in December, 2016 for IS in Libya. Um, and what we've seen over the last three years in particular is that they've done like two to five attacks each year in the last few years, which illustrates that there are there are still some people that continue to be a part of the group, but their capacities are much weakened. And in some ways, I would look at IS in Libya more akin to what we see in other contexts now, sort of in Somalia or Yemen, where they do have a presence, but it's very weak. Um, and there's other possibilities for mobilization with other organizations potentially um, in, in that same context. That's not to say, you know, obviously I can't predict the future and don't want to rule out anything, but I think that they are having a harder time than say what we saw with the Iraqi, the original franchise in many ways, um, in that they're able to bounce back in a way that we haven't seen so far in Libya. I want to move into audience questions now. We've got a bunch of, of really great asks and, and clearly an audience who knows this um, problem set well too. So the first one, um, to what extent are extremist jihadists in Africa willing to serve under more than one banner. So how usual is it for fighters or even higher level operatives to work for or with both the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda? Um, and is that changing as the competition between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda intensifies in Africa? 
uh, we had an, another questioner also reference um, the uh, relationship between Al Qaeda and the Islamic State in the Sahel in West Africa, where we had seen uh, a more cooperative approach between those groups that has turned a lot more hostile. So, uh, referring to that example or or others, um, Jason, do you have a, a thought on this? Sure. Th th these are uh, fantastic questions and really important ones. Um, not having prepared uh, to speak to this uh, explicitly, I can just sort of give some some data points as to, to how I think about this. I mean, one of the important points that I think deserves a, a bit more attention is, Emily, one that you brought up, which is, um, at what point do these insurgent groups actually decide to pledge allegiance to the Islamic State? Um, and so we see varying approaches um, in terms of their timelines as to when groups pledge. What, what is interesting to speak to this question is that we have seen uh, in many places around the continent, defectors of Al-Qaeda groups um, defect from Al-Qaeda and pledge allegiance um, to the Islamic State. So notably um, in the case of the Islamic State in Somalia, Abdul Qadir Mumin, who was a, 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 an Al-Shabaab ideologue uh, in the North defected uh, and pledged allegiance, creating a, a small and ultimately unsuccessful uh, Islamic State branch. Um, of course, Abu Adnan al Sahrawi, uh, who, who formed uh, the Islamic State in Greater Sahara, was inherently part of the broader um, series of, of, of Al Qaeda affiliated groups in the Sahel, who, for his own uh, personal reasons, sought to become a, a bigger, better jihadi, broke away from the Al Qaeda uh, network um, to, to ultimately become um, a leader of an Islamic State group. Um, in, in Sinai, of course, you have uh, Ansar Bayt al-Makdis, which never a formal Al-Qaeda affiliate, uh, was always sort of generally sympathetic to Al-Qaeda. And so um, to the extent that we, we sort of think about wearing two hats, I don't think it's common uh, in, in my studies, and I would certainly uh, stand to be corrected. Uh, I think the most common place where you would see this sort of phenomenon of, of sort of really playing both sides of the coin would be in the Sahel. I haven't seen it as extensively elsewhere, um, but I, I don't think it's incredibly common to, uh, I, I think of the term Sobel um, that, that we talk about, uh, soldiers by day, rebel by night, that it, very clear delineation of, of playing both sides. I, I don't think that we see that um, uh, as, as often uh, as we should. I'll, I'll defer, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. I, I've seen the Sahel example as the most interesting um, on this on this particular case, and and tracing the trajectory of the Islamic State in the Sahel, which is also under the West Africa province, but we'll also refer to it as Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. That that's interesting because I really see it through the lens of kind of an individual leading a group that had tried to distinguish himself um, in multiple different ways before um, pledging to the Islamic State and, and had bid for Islamic State recognition for a while uh, before achieving it. So on one hand, um, you could see that the impetus for kind of signing up for that affiliation coming from kind of more internal local motivations. That said, after the fact, that group has continued to evolve um, and kind of become more networked with um, of Islamic State, West Africa adopted new tactics and become a, a feature in uh, a lot of the Islamic State media. So it, there's this kind of before and after period that you can kind of make both arguments with. Um, speaking of that kind of evolution, we got a question about um, you know, the Islamic State has been kind of agile and, and evolutionary in its history. So the question is whether um, the groups in Africa will continue to focus on kind of territory and and conventional warfare or land-based insurgency, or whether they will go either in a more virtual direction or in, in some other trajectory um, in their next phase. So um, kind of what are your thoughts on whether kind of forming that, that territorial caliphate remains an important goal um, or kind of what these groups will maybe focus on, on next or how they will operate going forward? Um, I think Vincent, you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, if I have to try and answer that question from Lake Chad, I would say um, that the landed, landed rural state is, is, is very much on the page. And I, I really don't see how they could evolve um, in a sort of virtual jihad uh, with long distance connection. Uh, you know, on, on, on at least two occasions, I've been told by former fighters, the IS asked uh, ISWAP to send fighters uh, to Libya uh, and then also to, uh, to Mali, Niger. And on both occasions, they refused. Um, and I think it has to do with the fact that um, they, 
they are they are very local people you know very few of them speak english very few of them speak arabic so they are kind of tied to a locality and and they are about defending a community they are families um and and you know this is what they're up to they they, they are um they are very much a, a, a local story and 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 so they they want to fight that local story uh, in a global narrative and you know with this sense that okay crusaders and christians and so on we, we, they are enemies and and they are the same in in jerusalem and, and in in, uh, in maiduguri um but in the end um my impression is the 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 local grounding is is uh, is very deep at least as uh, as far as this web is concerned but then again it doesn't mean that there's no i mean there, there are other is types around um, and and I don't work with those types, so I can't say to I can't speak to the, to those examples. Um, so we got one question about religious credibility. So um, questioner asks, are we underestimating how significant the the religious credibility of um, either the, the caliphate or the leader of the faithful that that Islam the Islamic State has claimed? Um, does has that you know, how much has that boosted the Islamic State's image and, and does it still um, looking at the state of, of the Islamic State today? So if there are any examples we can draw on, maybe Brenda, from your experience um, on that question, how important is that kind of religious credibility piece? Sorry, Emily, you're breaking on that question. Could you just uh, shorten it? Yes, sorry. So how important is the religious credibility of the Islamic State for attracting um, the allegiance of, of some of these groups? Um, look, uh, I think the groups are, they, they hold their own, um, they try to espouse their own religious uh, credibility within their own uh, local groups. And I think that is the most important uh, factor or dynamic in terms of this whole religious credibility aspect. Because at the end of the day, in terms of their relationship with the Islamic State, it's a it's about affiliating with a particular jihadist brand, uh, not really about religious credibility. Uh, that is more important within a local, more regional context. I wonder, Aaron, if you could speak to that. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Sorry to call you out. <laughs> sure, that's fine. I mean, uh, I obviously focus more on the Arab world and the sub-Saharan context. So, but I mean, I, I would argue that one of the key reasons why so many foreign fighters did go to Iraq and Syria in the first place was because of this announcement that they reestablished the caliphate whether you consider it legitimate or not, people that believed in it, believed in it. Um, and it was a way for them to build this new society, uh, God's kingdom on earth. Um, and many of them saw themselves as sort of a recreation of the Sahaba or the companions of the prophet, where they're once again recreating the original caliphate. Um, and therefore, for many of them, that's one of the reasons why they decided to join up. And that's why after June 2014, you saw a huge spike in foreign fighters going to Iraq and Syria. So I think uh, for those that are more ideologically inclined, that's important. Of course, um, many within Iraq and Syria itself, locals, um, they join for more uh, you know, regular reasons. They're trying to survive or they're looking for some economic benefits or, or their tribe was somehow connected to aspects of IS because some of the leaders might have been a part of the tribe and therefore they went a part of it. So I think it's also important to disaggregate uh, some of the local reasons why people get involved versus those for the that are the foreign fighters, which are usually a bit more extreme and ideological compared to those that are localized. But I'm just talking about in the Iraq Syrian context. I'm sure it's different in Nigeria to Mali to DRC to Mozambique to Somalia uh, to Sinai, etc. Yes, I mean, I, I think I, my experience in Lake Chad is quite similar to Aaron's. I mean, the, the, the two things were there. I mean, clearly there was there are for affiliation there are some very local, sometimes very opportunistic dimensions for some people. But there are also a number of people who are you know really real believers. Like the, the narrative matters, and and they, 
they were really enthused about about the caliphate, especially in a moment when Shekau um, was beginning, you know, to to give deliver results that were a bit disappointing. And there, there was a hope there, I think, uh, pretty strong. And I, in a number of interviews, also um, some people expressed, um, um, you know, they, they deprecated their own religious uh, and theological uh, competence, and and they said, oh, we, you know, it's good that we have we have the caliph and all his is is the scholars around him because they know Islam better than we do, and and so we can we can know how to we can know better how to uh, to behave as as good Muslims. I mean, I it's been said on and on, but I, there is a there is a, a thirst and an interest for orthodoxy and orthopraxy in, in, in part of these movements. I think that is that is extremely strong. You know, people want to behave the proper way, or at least some of them. And and it's it's an important element I find in discussions. Well, that brings us to our time. Um, there is so much more we could continue to talk about. I feel like we've just scratched the the surface here, and we could do you know hours on each of these groups individually. Um, but I, I want to thank the panelists so much for their time um, and for sticking to time on their remarks, which it's rare to see everyone do. So extra round of applause for that, um, and thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, so for everyone watching, um, please keep an eye out. We'll keep, uh, we'll update you on um, the next steps in this series. We're planning to have a couple more debates on this topic and get more into um, both the analytical debates and the policy debates. Um, we welcome any feedback on this format uh, and any ideas for questions you'd like to see debated uh, or people you'd like to see involved. Uh, we'll hope, we're hoping that this series will be useful for the community to work through some of these uh, more nuanced questions that uh, we don't always get to discuss in that much detail. Um, so with that, thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much panelists for participating and everyone have a great day.